in front of you or scan that QR code behind me. A uh, really great way to keep us connected. If it's your first time, we'd love for you to fill out that connection card and bring it to the welcome desk on your way out and they have a gift for you there. Uh, another thing that the connection card does, if uh, you don't receive our Sunday morning emails, uh, Sunday morning emails contain a lot of the things that the bulletin has, a lot of reminders of things coming up. Uh, we have our men's conference next weekend. Uh, we have our fall festival coming up with just a lot of different things, and that email contains all of that. So if you don't get those emails, uh, make a note of that on the connection card that you want to receive those, and we'll get you on the right list for that. I always just want to keep you informed of all the different things going on here at Norwin. Uh, just a lot happening. So we're going to continue our series called Mirage, and we've been looking at different things that uh, are non-existent things, yet for some of us, we're chasing after them like they are going to give us life. And at the end, we realize they've just been a mirage. And uh, there's been time wasted or effort wasted chasing this mirage of what doesn't exist. And we want to expose those mirages to see what really does exist and see who God really is. And so I want to start off with a bit of a confession this morning. I think I can be honest with you all, partly because I don't think I'm the only one that deals with this. But here's my confession this morning. I don't know if I can honestly say that I always fully trust God. It's, it's hard, right, to put our full trust in God. I mean, it's difficult. It's easy to say I trust in God, but it is hard hard to do it. Uh, we spend money all the time that says we trust in God, but I just, I'm not sure we do. I'm not sure others do. In our divided political environment, racial tension, increased prices everywhere, you keep wondering, are we going to make it till tomorrow? And so we play these what-if games, these what-if scenarios. We, we look at these things around us and we say, okay, what if the wrong person gets elected? The wrong person, according to you, gets elected. What if? What's going to happen? What if I get laid off tomorrow? What if my kids need something for school and I can't afford it? What if I get hurt and I can't pay the medical bills? What if I don't find someone I stay single the rest of my life? It is really difficult to trust God in these scenarios when, when this is all we see around us and we don't see God. We don't see how God showed up in any circumstance around us. It certainly seems like, seems like everything is falling apart. Where is God in all of this? This is what I'm seeing, and I'm not seeing God. Beyond that, there have been times in my life where I really did feel like I placed my full trust in God, and He didn't show up. I was really trusting God for something. I was really praying with everything I had that God would come through for me in this way, and He didn't. So how, how can I trust God? It's no wonder that I have difficulties. You have difficulties. Others have difficulties in trusting God in these scenarios and others. So like I said, I started off with this confession because I don't think I'm alone, and we're going to look at a king in the Bible that dealt with a trust issue too. He had a hard time trusting God, and we're going to examine his shortcomings a little bit because for him, his story ended in tragedy. And for you and I, I want us to stop chasing this mirage before it ends in tragedy for us too. So to give context to this king a little bit, uh, we're going to open up the Old Testament, the book of 1 Kings, and we're going to find that this king uh, in the line of Israel, God's family, the, the chosen people that would one day uh, the, the Messiah would be raised out of these people. They were led out of slave, slavery from Egypt uh, to the promised land, the modern day Israel, Jordan, Syria area where there's some conflict happening. First three kings of this nation were King Saul, David, and Solomon. But one of Solomon's sons uh, was very heavy-handed and created some tension. And so the nation split. The, the one nation, Israel, split into two. The northern kingdom split from the southern kingdom. And in their, their split, not only did they split politically, they, 
they split a bit spiritually as well. They walked away from God in this time and they started chasing after lesser gods, the, the gods of the surrounding nations. And one of those gods was named Baal or Baal. And the king that was leading at this time was named Ahab. So we have King Ahab who's chasing lesser gods, not the God of scripture, not Yahweh anymore. And he was mainly going after this God named Baal. And in his worship to Baal, he built temples. He hired prophets that uh, would prophet, prophesy anything that King Ahab wanted to hear. Um, he, he built these Asherah poles, whose Asherah was supposedly this other God, uh, Baal's mother, in fact. And so Ahab was doing all of this in worship to another God. And there'd still be times that Yahweh, the God of scripture, would send messengers, would send prophets to King Ahab to remind Ahab who the true God was. One of these times was with the prophet Elijah. And Elijah had this, one of these times with King Ahab had this show off between the God of scripture and Baal, who would show up in fire. And if you know the story, there's kind of this lopsided competition and Yahweh shows up in fire and the prophets of Baal run with their tail between their legs because their, their God, Baal, didn't show up. And so Ahab is reminded who the true God is throughout his life, but it never really sticks. He continues to choose this lesser God named Baal. Well, there comes a time in his life when Ahab aligns himself with the southern kingdom. So even though they're, they're split, they're going to go into battle together against another nation. And so 400 prophets of Baal speak to Ahab, again, anything he wants to hear, and they say, yes, Ahab, go into battle, you're going to be victorious. But the king of the south, Jehoshaphat, he has this nickname, Jumping Jehoshaphat, I'm not quite sure why. <laughs> uh, he, not really. Um, <laughs> Jehoshaphat's like, this doesn't really sound right. These 400 prophets are, are, are telling us we're going to be successful. I'm not, are, are you sure? Maybe there's, maybe there's just one other prophet that could speak the words of God because what they're saying, it just doesn't really sound like a good plan. Is there someone here that will still tell the truth? And Ahab's like, yes, there's one other prophet. His name is Micaiah, and he, he never tells me what I want to hear. Let's read this account. First, First Kings 22, verse 8. Ahab knows, Micaiah knows. It says, the king of Israel answered Jehoshaphat, there's still one prophet through whom we can inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. He is Micaiah, son of Imla. King should not say such a thing, Jehoshaphat replied. So Jehoshaphat um, encourages Ahab to call him in. And so now the prophet Micaiah comes in. And I imagine it's a picture uh, like what you've seen in a movie scene where uh, the character comes in the door and everybody turns and gets quiet because they know, okay, here's the one that's going to mess up all our plans. We had a great party going on, and here's the party pooper. It's Micaiah. It's going to tell us the truth. We don't like him. King says he hates him. So he comes in, and this is what happens in verse 15. It says, when he arrived, the king asked him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or not? Attack and be victorious, he answered, for the Lord will give it into the king's hands. The king said to him, how many times must I make you swear to tell me nothing but the truth and in the name of the Lord? So then Micaiah answered, I saw all Israel scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, these people have no master. Let each one go home in peace. And the king Israel said to Jehoshaphat, didn't I tell you that he never prophesies anything good about me, but only bad? And so this is an interesting account here. Micaiah first was asked, hey, tell me, tell me what I should do. And I think it's ironic. I think Micaiah was making a point here when he said, okay, go, go. You're going to be victorious. Micaiah was asked, what do you think we should do? And Micaiah hears it. 
isn't saying what the Lord is saying. This is what he's going to say secondly. And Micaiah knew the truth. He, he said, okay, go, you're going to have victory. But then, but then King Ahab said, no, 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 no. Tell, haven't I told you, tell me what the Lord says. And so this is the second prophecy that the prophet has. And he says, no, I, I see all of Israel scattered. You're, you're going to be defeated. They're going to be without a shepherd, right? They're king. They're going to be without the king. Essentially, the king is going to die. And this is exactly how it's going to end. Ahab's going to be bleeding to death in his chariot by the end of the day in this battle. Ahab knew the truth. Micaiah knew the truth. But Ahab didn't want to listen to the truth. Ahab didn't, didn't want to worship a God that was all truth, a God that he had to give his full trust and surrender to. And so Ahab turned to Baal, uh, where Ahab could still trust himself. He could still find himself to be adequate. But when he needed rain, he would pray to Baal for it to rain. When he needed aid in battle, he would pray to Baal to give him aid as long as he kept Ahab secure as king. But for Ahab to truly worship, for Ahab to truly surrender, to have complete trust, Ahab knew all along Baal was inadequate. I think Ahab knew all along that he was just hiring prophets to tell him what he wanted to hear. I mean, Baal was, was, was fine with at one point Ahab killing a man to expand his vegetable garden. And here Baal did nothing. Going back to the prophet Elijah on the mountain, uh, Baal didn't show up, but Yahweh showed up. And so Ahab knew the truth. Yet the entire time, he's the most, most wealthiest man in the land most powerful man of control, had, had this civilized religion where he hired these prophets, yet he was grumpy throughout the entire time. He could never fully be pleased. If someone today had that position, it seems like they would be nothing but happy. They'd be content with what they have, yet Ahab's heart never found rest. And it never found rest because Ahab knew all along the truth. The truth that what he had in Baal would never give him peace. But, but what could give him peace, Yahweh, was nothing he could ever fully surrender to. His heart couldn't fully trust Baal, yet that's what he chose to worship. Let, let me give us a little historical account on who Baal is, this, this God that Ahab worshipped. The story of Baal is an ancient Near Eastern Western God that, or Eastern God that had this, this helmet of horns that's often depicted in this uh, graffiti that we see these pictures of Baal. He's a rider of clouds, a club in one hand and a spear in the other hand. Uh, Baal was a, a God of the storms and of weather. He supposedly brought, brought rain and fertility. The story goes that Baal defeated Yam, Yam was the god of the sea, and then after he defeated Yam, he was slain by Mot, and Mot was the god of the underworld. And so as Baal was defeated and going to the underworld, Baal had one last hurrah by mating with a heifer. This wasn't the end of Baal and because of that, and so his sister Anat killed Mot, who Mot killed Baal, and so they had this cycle of being revived and it was the struggle of death and fertility. And so that's why Baal was seen as the, the annual uh, vegetative cycle. And they would pray for rains and harvest and crops. Here's a picture behind me of one prayer that was recorded to Baal. And so this is on a tablet. And they recorded this prayer that they would say together uh, to Baal. And it, it goes like this. Oh, Baal, if you drive the mighty one from our gate, the warrior from our walls... A bull, O Baal, will we consecrate. A vow, Baal, we will fulfill. A firstborn, Baal, we will consecrate. A flesh sacrifice, we will fulfill. A feast, Baal, we will prepare. The sanctuary, Baal, we will ascend. The path of your temple, we will walk. Then, Baal, we will listen. Uh, will you listen to our prayers? He will drive the mighty one from our gate, the warrior from our walls. 
Do you see in that prayer the transactional relationship? If you, we will. If then, we will. If you hear, we will. We will if you hear, if you respond. It's this understanding that Baal will show up when they show up. Uh, When the worshipers do their part, then that God Baal will come through when they need him, when they need rain or when they need a protector. They'll look to their God for those things. But the other things that they can do themselves, well, they'll just do themselves. They don't need Baal for everything. They can, they can trust themselves for all the other things, but when they need Baal, they'll pray to Baal or they'll pray to a different God when they need some other thing in life or they'll pray, they'll choose another God to pray and worship when they need still something else. And for some reason, Yahweh, God of Scripture, has to continually coax his people back from worshiping these lesser gods, from having affairs with these false gods and having to convince them that he is better. And it should be obvious to them that Yahweh, that God of Scripture is better and these other gods are inferior, that God is holy, God has power. After all God did for his people, was it not clear? And it was clear. In fact, I think it was very clear. And maybe God's superiority, that God is bigger and better, was actually part of the problem when it came to his people trusting him. It seems like the people of God kept wanting something less, something less imposing, less demanding, less holy. Why would that be? I think there's two reasons, probably a lot more, but two that we're going to talk about today. One is because we have this natural tendency and love to trust ourselves. We, we just want to trust ourselves. We can do it. I have the power. I have the control. And the second thing is that we're probably thinking wrongly about God. And that's the first point I want to make this morning. If I think wrongly about God, I will struggle to trust God. If I think wrongly about God, I will always struggle to trust God. And I think the people that we see in Scripture have skewed views of who God really is, and that in their wrong thinking causes them to struggle to fully trust God. Pastor A.W. Tozer says this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The most portentous fact about any man is not what he at a given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move towards our mental image of God. This is our mirage, that we have a mirage of God, a mental image of God, and we have a a natural tendency not to move towards what is true about God and what we read in Scripture all the time, but our mental image of who God is or what God could do for us. That's just a natural tendency for us. And so when I think wrong about God, I'm still moving towards that picture of God, and I will always struggle to trust God. Let me give you a few examples of this. If you think God has more important things to do than to listen to you, then you're always going to struggle in your prayer life. If you think that God is able to forgive other people's sins, but your sins are, are deeper and your sins go further back and your sins are, are more than other people's sins and God can forgive them, but maybe not you, then you will always struggle understanding God's forgiveness and love for you. If you believe that God is angry at you and just waiting for you to mess up, then you're always going to struggle with cowering in fear before God. And so it's true that what you think about God is either going to draw you closer to God or draw you further away from God. So God is bigger and better than whatever gods we put beside him. Yet we choose those lesser gods. And I think this is where I put myself in understanding that when I struggle to fully trust God, it's because I'm putting something up against him. And I'd rather choose myself in a situation. I'd rather choose someone else's advice or the world's advice 
and that situation. And so this is where we get to our mirage for today. Here's the mirage. I want to find peace through trusting what I can't trust. I want to find peace through trusting what I can't trust. I really want peace in my life. I really want understanding in my life. And so I'm going to trust whatever it is over here. Even though time and time again, I've seen those things disappoint or hurt or not come through because that's what our world is full of. Everything in our world is wasting away. It's degrading. Even ourselves, even our minds. Yet I've, I've chosen to place my trust in there. And because of that, I will never find peace. Ahab was never able to find peace. Even though he hired 400 prophets to tell him exactly what he wanted to hear, he never had peace. He always had to question that. No, no, no. Tell me what is really the truth. Tell me what the Lord says. This is what I've, I want from you, Micaiah. He never had peace in his soul. He was always going back and forth. You could hire 400 people to tell you exactly what you want to hear in life, but that will never give you peace because you know in your heart of heart you can't trust it because it didn't come through last time because you know it's disappointed other people and it's going to be the same story for you. We can't give our best. We can't give our our full commitment, our full trust over to something else that hasn't produced trust or hasn't come through for other people in times for them. And so it's almost too bad that God is too big and, and, and too out there because, because we can't grasp a hold of that. We have these lesser things that we can grasp a hold of, and that's why we often choose to do it. That's, that's why we do. We, we can cling on to those things, but God is almost too big and too holy. We want we want God to just be able to, to settle for what we already have and not ask too much for us. He's too holy. He's just asking too much. And so God actually made himself small. So we can cling on to God. And that's the truth that we're getting at in this message with this mirage. The mirage is we're, we're trying to find peace through trusting what I can't trust. But the truth is this. I can cling to a big God that made himself small so I can know and I can trust him. I can cling on to that God. A God that made himself small enough that I can understand him. That made himself small enough that I can approach him. How small did God make himself so that I can understand him? As small as an embryo. Christmas morning, this this baby was born, but not just a baby. God became small so I can can get my hands around him, so I can understand him, so I can cling to him. I specifically put that word and that truth, cling. Because that's often what we're looking to do when we're trying to trust something. We're clinging to something. Oh, someone's going to say they're going to come through for me in this political season. I'm going to cling to that because I want to trust that. I want to trust something because I just don't know anymore. God's saying, no, 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 I'm going to make myself small so you can cling on to me, so you can, you can know that I understand you. But if there's one problem when God made, well, there's maybe a few problems, but there's one problem when God made himself small is that God opened himself up to smack talk. And so I want to show another picture this morning. This is the earliest picture that we have of Jesus being drawn, the earliest graffiti image. And in this image, it's actually mocking Jesus. You see a man there on a cross, and he has a head of a donkey. And beneath it is a man kneeling. And the caption of this image says, Alexamos worships his God. It's an image of mockery. It actually was unveiled uh, in a building that had been renovated and had been behind a wall for centuries. And so in their attempts to date it, they dated to about 300 AD, and they think it's someone mocking a Roman official that this official was worshiping a man that was on a cross. And to this graffiti artist, it makes a little bit of sense that that it would be strange for someone to, to worship a God that had been crucified, a God that had died. Yet it's at the foot of the cross we finally find something worth trusting. A God big enough to make himself small enough to save 
us. I want to look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16, and we're going to see this relationship of, of God making himself small so we can cling and approach God with confidence. Uh, Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, it says, For we do not have a high priest, this is speaking of Jesus, Jesus being a type of high priest from the Old Testament. We do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It's, it's this, this picture that in the Old Testament, there's high priests, and the high priests, well, they lived separate from the people, and they dressed separate from the people, and they didn't understand the people's needs. And so when they would pray to God for the people, were they really praying what the people needed? But, but now that we have Jesus, we have a high priest that understands. We have a high priest in Jesus that knows temptation. And Jesus knows poverty and he knows frustration. And Jesus knows weariness. And Jesus knows disappointment. And Jesus knows rejection. And Jesus knows sorrow. And Jesus knows ridicule. And Jesus knows loneliness. And so we have a Jesus that gives us confidence to approach God in his throne room. Because God is no longer out there, too big for me to grasp and cling on to. But the truth is, God made himself small. Small enough that I can now know and appreciate how I can approach God and have confidence before the throne. That's what God has done for you and I so we can trust him. So we can cling on to him. So we no longer say, well, look at all these things I see out in the world that, that I'm just struggling and making these what-if scenarios. But we can see Jesus. We can see what was, his life was like to live on earth and live in a world that we live in. And so here's my two very, very specific things to, do, to, to help us understand, to, to fight the natural tendency within us, to exchange a, a big God for a smaller God that we can understand. Here's my two encouragements for you this week and following is to read and to remember. To read and remember. And when I say read, I don't mean just read a good book, though that's a good thing too, but to read scripture. To read scripture. Scripture gives us a unique perspective about who God is. If, if our thinking our wrong thinking about God is always going to give us a struggle of trusting God, then we need to get right thinking about God. And how are we ever going to get right thinking of God outside of Scripture? This is how God has revealed Himself to us. So read Scripture. Get a, get a daily rhythm of diving into Scripture and knowing God. We live in a great age of science where they're doing great discoveries about the, the mind and the body. And there's studies that talk about how the, the, the wrong thoughts or just thoughts in general wire our brain. They give us like these ruts in our brain. And so we have this natural tendency to go back into our ruts of thinking. And so reading scripture will literally rewire your brain to have correct thoughts about God and a correct understanding about who God is. So read daily. It's so important to be in your scripture. And the second one is to remember. Throughout scripture, we see these these festivals, these all-day feasts, these remembrance celebrations uh, that God had would have them build these little rock altars when there's a significant event that happened because God knew people will forget. So one day they'll be stumbling, and not stumbling, they'll be walking and they'll, they'll hit their toe and they'll stumble on this rock, this, these things of rock, and they'll go, what happened? And, oh yeah, this is what happened. God led us through the, the, the sea right here. This is where it was split open. Kids, come here. You weren't here. But let me tell you what happened when I was younger. And they'll remember. And there's a feast time to remember God's faithfulness to his people, leading them out of Egypt. And so every year they would have this feast and they have a script to go through with their family to remember God, to remember God's faithfulness. And you need to do that in your life too. I don't know what that looks like. Maybe it's a rock altar in your bedroom. I don't know. You go, hey, this represents when God brought me through this circumstance. I remember this prayer I prayed. And it was a prayer of desperation and God came through. 
Because there's other times where it seems like God didn't come through, or maybe just the answer to the prayer was no, you really wanted it to be yes, but that wasn't God's will, and, and you felt like he didn't come through for you, but you remember that God is still on his throne. Maybe it's journaling, and you use that journal, look back on that prayer list that you have, and go, yeah, man, God has come through time and time and time again, and I am going to remember. Here's two verses I want to leave you with. One is Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him and He will make your paths straight. Cling to the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own mirage where you think your trust should be placed, but in the Lord. And then Psalms 20, verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. We don't have many battles that are fought with chariots and horses anymore. But what could you put in there that fight battles for your trust? Some trust in politics, some trust in celebrities, some trust in enough moral correction in our world. Uh, Some trust in preachers, but we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. God has asked us to go all in on our trust for him. There are so many lesser gods that we use as substitutes for that trust uh, because it allows us to understand it and see it and, and reserve some trust for ourselves. But God says, I don't want you to reserve trust for yourselves because you're fallen and broken and hurt. He wants us to go all in on our trust for him. Let me pray for us. Dear Lord, we are so thankful that you are big. We're so thankful that you are holy and powerful because it means we can place our trust in you. And you've, you've remained with those characteristics, but in doing so, you still made yourself small so we can understand your bigness. You made yourself small so we can see you and, and your son and what it was like for him to remain perfect yet live in this world, to be tempted, to be lonely, to be hurt. And so, God, we can grasp a hold of that and we can grasp a hold of you through your son. Lord, we're so thankful for your words And God, I pray that we would continue to be readers of your word, to get correct understanding and thoughts about who you are so that we can have our trust fully in you. We pray all this in your son.